needs this title. People know he's a great scorer, but I have a feeling a lot of people like refuse to put him. Maybe I mean he's borderline top thirty all time, but I think people refuse him to be higher just because he has just disappointed over the past few years in the playoffs. Welcome to the Monday, November 30th edition of the TV on Basketball Podcast with your host TV. Hope your day is going good and thank you for clicking on to watch or listen to this episode. Before we start, I have to plug my other platforms. Remember to follow at TV on Basketball on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram for updates on the podcast and for other great content. If you are on YouTube, remember to like, share, and to subscribe. It would be highly appreciated. For all podcast listeners, remember to subscribe and leave a review if you are on Apple. As for Spotify, Anchor, and Podbean listeners, just continue to support to show your support in any way possible. And I just have a great show lined up for you guys today. We're going to be talking about more frequency signings, which I haven't discussed last week. Maybe a couple of trades. I, I really don't think there are many trades whatsoever. We're going to talk about stuff regarding... Um, the NBA's upcoming season in terms of preseason and just more COVID protocols. And I'm also going to tackle a question which has been kind of running through my mind over these past few days, and we're going to end the show with that. So sit back, relax, and let's jump into this first topic. And we're going to be talking about these new deals. The first um, two people I want to be talking about kind of has to coincide with people I had to talk about last week because they're all part of the 2017 draft class. I mean, except for this first guy I'm talking about. But um, one of them has to do with the 2017 draft class. This other guy finally got the extension we've all been waiting for. And we're going to be talking about Brandon Ingram. And he finally got his extension. Five years, $158 million from the New Orleans Pelicans. And as I talked about last week, I was just surprised at the fact that this wasn't done. I thought this was going to be one of their biggest priorities um, trying trying to figure it out, um, what they're going to do with Brandon Ingram. But I guess with the moves that they made, you know, getting rid of Drew Holiday, re-signing Steven Adams to that two-year $35 million extension, which I uh, they, they signed him to a two-year $35 million extension. I think they're just waiting to see how the money will work, and then they're going to um, deal with Ingram afterwards because he's restricted. They have his bird rights. They could literally just go over to cap to sign him. They had to make this deal done. The Pelicans absolutely had to make this deal done. Whether you think it's worth it or not, that can be put up for debate. But Brandon Ingram coming off a season where career numbers all across the board. After getting out of LA, this guy just ended up, you know, going ham, to be completely honest. And with that with Zion out of the lineup, he was able to show kind of what he was what people were expecting from him coming out of Duke as the number two overall pick. I mean, last year, twenty three points per game. Basically 24, 6 rebounds, 4 assists, 46% from the field, almost 40% from 3. This guy put up mad numbers last year. And even like I said, like this is we're going to talk about this with Bogdanovich later. Even if you don't, like even if it doesn't work out like to like what they expect, the New Orleans Pelicans, you know, him besides Zion, he's an asset. He's just an asset. And you need to just hold on to assets, especially when you have the opportunity like restricted free agency. That's why I was kind of confused what the Kings were trying to do later on. But at the end of the day, the Pelicans made this move and honestly it was necessary. Brandon Ingram, there for five years. It's going to be very exciting to see how they're going to fare next year. Next player we're going to be talking about is Bam Adebayo. And he also got a massive extension. Five years, $163 million for Bam Adebayo. Um... From the Miami Heat. I mean, he got the max contract. We knew he was going to get something like this. I thought they were going to figure it out for next year, to be completely honest, because um, you know they're all over like the Giannis sweepstakes. I honestly believe that I believe that you know they're going to sign Giannis next year, or at least attempt to, and then they're going to try to deal with Bam afterwards. But no, they um, gave him the contract. For this season, five years, one hundred sixteen million dollars, and what really confused me about this is, this is probably going to take them out of the Giannis sweepstakes, because their cap situation is just kind of messy after this. I mean, I, that's why like people like 
thought that it was going to happen next year. Once you sign Giannis, although you're you're going to be going over the cap with Bam, I mean, it's just going to be, I think it's just going to kind of like fit all of them because that's how the contract situation works in in the NBA. But he is worth max money. Let's be completely honest. He had a most improved type season. We talked about Brandon Ingram. I mean, Bam Adebayo was in the conversation for most improved as well. This guy had a fantastic season, being a first-time All-Star as well, showing what he could do in the bubble. I mean, this year, 16 points, 10 rebounds, 5 assists. One of the best passing big men in the league as well. And those playoff stats, man. I mean, especially when you look at his series versus the Boston Celtics. He's worth max money. But I think the question now for Heat fans is, what do you think is this guy's ceiling? Like, do you think this guy's going to be a top 10 NBA player? I don't really see that. But I think he's going to be top 30, top 20, borderline top 20 for sure. And I just think that you just have to get this deal done. I'm just surprised you did it now. I mean, it was obvious he was going to get re-signed. But I guess they're trying to send a message to their team like, you know, we got our guys. If you... If uh, if you you know contribute to our to our hustle, if we believe that you're worth it, we don't mind giving you the money. You just have to put in the work, and I mean that's what this whole team did. Bam, being one of them, and yeah, he's there for the next five years. I don't think Bam he fans can be um, sad about that, but that just takes one other team out of the Giannis sweepstakes, and that's gonna be very interesting to see how that all f- unfolds next year. So yeah, Bam out about to the Miami Heat. Easy decision, but let's we're we're gonna have to wait and see um, what's gonna happen with Giannis because this is one of the this is like one of the top contenders for him as well. So this is gonna be very interesting. Let's move on to the next contract. And although not a lot of people were gonna be talking about this, he is one of my guys, so I do feel like I have to talk about him. We're gonna be talking about Bull Bull. And if you remember, guys, last year in my mock draft episode, I had Bull Bull going number fourteen to the Boston Celtics. I thought that the Celtics were in need of a center, and I think that his upside was just too big for them not to, to pass up. Well, they didn't just pass up on him. Freaking every team in the league did in the first round. I mean, this guy dropped to the second round. I honestly thought this guy was a potential lottery pick, and this guy dropped all the way to the second round. Pick 46, I believe. No, 44. Pick 44. of this, And... I just thought that the Denver Nuggets, they've done it again. They've got another player, um, although very raw, but he has the skills. He definitely has the skills um, to be really good in this league. And they're they're finally giving him his worth. They converted his two-way contract to a two-year, $4.1 million deal. And with Mason Plumlee going to the Detroit Pistons, this just leaves an opening for Bull Bull to step in and possibly get his chance and in, in, as a backup center as we've seen in the bubble this guy has the skills this guy has passing ability this guy can dribble he even has a small three-point shot on him and i just wanted to i want to see him to do well ever since he dropped to the second round like he i have considered him like one of my guys and i just want him to do like really well because this guy's freaking what seven two he's seven two can has all these skills Yes, he needs to put on muscle for sure. Yes, we don't know about his injury, how his injuries are going to play out. But it's worth it. It's definitely worth um, the risk. And now he's getting his chance here. Let's see what's going to happen if he can fit beside um, Jokic. It's going to be really weird having two seven-footers if they end up trying to do that. But this year, he's definitely going to have a chance. Hopefully, he does well. I really want him to do well because this Nuggets team, man, if all the pieces flow right... Him, MPJ, Jamal Murray, Nikola Jokic, this team could be scary. This team can be scary over the next few years. And I think Bobo will have to improve for that to um, make them, you know, championship contenders. But it's definitely worth the risk. Two years, $4.1 million for Bobo. I think it's a damn good deal. Let's move on to someone who is even, um, who used to be, um, regarded as one of the top centers in the league, but he has had a fall from grace. And we're going to be talking about Hassan Whiteside, who one of the last free ag- like um, decently named free agents to be signed this offseason, and he's finally found a home. He is going back to his roots. He is signing with the Sacramento Kings on a one-year minimum deal. Oh, what a fall from grace, like I said earlier. I mean, 
the thing is, last year he didn't have bad stats. Fifth, like almost 16 points a game, almost 14 rebounds. Um, still led the league in blocks, um, going 2.9 blocks per game. But that's the thing with Whiteside. You see the stats and you're like, how is this guy not a getting more money and b not getting more playing time? Because he's just there's just some things that he doesn't show on the um, on the stat sheet, and Hassan Whiteside just doesn't like pro- doesn't do anything for that. I mean, Hassan Whiteside had his moments with the Trailblazers last year, and although he was like putting up these numbers, like, even the Trailblazers didn't really want him back. I think they were comfortable with having Nurkic and Zach Collins in that uh, in those positions, and they didn't even thought to bring back Whiteside. And he go back to the Sacramento Kings where he began his NBA career, but the fact that he's on a minimum dollar deal just shows like what his value is around the league. We remember last time when he was with the Miami Heat, he put up those massive numbers like when he was on that short term deal, and he had his, probably his best season when he um, averaged fourteen points a game, three um, um, three point seven blocks. Actually, even the, the season after that, seven. 17 points a game and 14 rebounds. Like, he got his bread. He got his money. But after that, he just started going on this decline. He just wasn't showing the effort. And that's what people... And I think, like, he just has his reputation around the league where, you know, if you bring him in, yes, he'll give you the stats, but he's not going to impact your team in a positive way. And this is why he's not getting the money. And... Could he possibly start for the Kings? Maybe, if they move Bielitsa to the bench. But I just think that it's it's really like it's really odd to see someone with these type of stats um, um, just not get like a- anything more than the minimum deal. But that just shows, man, effort like means more than anything. And he hasn't been able to show that kind of throughout his NBA career. And now he's <laughs> getting a minimum deal, which is absolutely crazy to me. Let's move on to the next deal, and we're going to be talking about Dario Saric re-signing with the, um, with the Phoenix Suns. Three years, $27 million. This is one of the last guys I was like like waiting for for the Suns to re-sign. Um, Dario Saric came in, I think, through a trade with the Philadelphia 76ers. He ended up in Phoenix, and he played pretty good, pretty good for them. Ten points per game, six rebounds, under two assists, but he, uh, he didn't have the same role as he did in... 76ers, but he still provided positive impact, a positive impact on the team, and it's really good to get him back um, as a backup. Three years, twenty-seven for a caliber uh, player of like, sorry, Dario Saric. I think it's it's definitely worth it. He could shoot the ball, and he's just a perfect guy to put on the second unit. You know, just tell him to space the floor. He has kind of the green light to hit from three, and he's passable on defense. I mean, he. He is still a decent rebounder at 6.2 points a game, and I just think that he can definitely, you know, provide something for this for the Suns team, especially just gives him like an extra element. Maybe he can end game sometimes. I mean, yes, they have um, Cam Johnson and stuff like that, but Saric has a bit more experience than him, and he can like literally just um, plug him into the starting lineup, put him on the bench. I don't think he really minds, and it kind of just fits into the whole like Suns. Um, plan, which is we want to get into the playoffs this year, and we're going to build a team around Devin Booker, which proves that one, we want him to stay, and two, like we're like we want to win. We want to win. Yes, yes, they will make the playoffs in my opinion, but they're not really going to go much farther, maybe to the second round. But for a Suns team which haven't made the playoffs in who knows how long, probably since the Steve Nash days, they needed they need to like show like some re- resemblance of um, success. And I think that this year could be the year for that to happen. So, yeah, Sarge back to the Suns. Very, very much needed for the Suns. And I cannot wait to watch them next year. I mean, we're going to be going into the preseason soon, which is going to be very soon. And we're going to be able to see these guys on the court. Let's move on to the last year we're going um, to be talking about. I kind of mentioned this slightly um, when I was talking about Bam Adebayo, but... The person I was really referencing to back then was Boy Bogdan Bogdanovich. Um, I I don't think I talked about it last week, but he signed an offer sheet with the Hawks. No, I think I talked about this in um, the Friday podcast with Trent Basketball. Um, we talked about um, Boy, Bogdan Bogdanovich getting that a four-year, seventy-two million dollar offer sheet from the Atlanta Hawks, 
And honestly, like in these type of situations, especially with restricted free agents with talent, a la a Bogdan Bogdanovich, I was just assuming that the Kings were going to match in whether they kept him on the roster or not, just use him as a trade asset. But no, that was not the case. The Kings literally just let him walk. Yeah, he didn't. They had two days to match his contract, and they did not um, match it. And now he is going to be a member of the Atlanta Hawks. Is four years seventy-two million a lot? Probably. But as we talked about early um, last week with Gordon Hayward, I mean, I didn't really mention this, but they, they're going to need to overpay if, if for restricted free agency, for restricted free agents, and. Although it could, it does seem a lot for the Bogdan Bogdanovich, I think that the Atlanta Hawks are kind of going in the same direction as the Phoenix Suns, in the sense where they want to show some playoff success now. No, they didn't have as long of a drought in the playoffs like Phoenix. I mean, they still had that really good team in the mid-2010s. But they needed to show Trey Young that we are dead set on winning, and we have built this roster around you by adding people such as Gallinari, adding people like Bogdanovich, to really bolster up the um, the depth of this team. What's really interesting about the Atlanta Hawks right now, though, is I don't I don't want to say that they have too many players, but there's too many possible rotation players, in my opinion, because you have this team, um, you know, obviously led by Trey Young. They still have um, John Collins, but if you just look up and down the roster, I mean, Bogdan Bogdanovich, obviously, I think he is going to start beside Trey Young. You have Danilo Gallinari. You brought in Rondo. You still have Kevin Herter, who I think is a pretty damn good um, shooter for that team. They drafted on Yaka Okongwu. They have Clint Capella. And don't forget, the last year they still had their two lottery picks in Cam Reddish and DeAndre Hunter. Like, I just think that this these deals maybe could stunt their growth or and stuff like that, because, especially because you invested a lot of money in Bogdanovich in Gallinari. I mean, I think they're making, on average, almost... $40 million a year for this team. So it's really interesting to see like the type of direction they're going is um, with the Hawks because I thought that they were going to maybe like bring in some nice like veteran pieces to help help out these young guys, but they brought in veteran pieces who look like they're going to be taking the spot of those young guys, if you know what I'm saying. And, I mean, it's probably a good situation to have to have like all these different types of players, but it's, ve- it's very interesting to see like how they're going to continue to grow them. I mean, is Bogdanovich going to come off the bench? Probably not. But what's that going to do with Cam Reddish's development? What's going to happen to DeAndre Hunter? I mean, it does seem like that Gallinari is going to start. But who knows? Maybe Gallinari is going to be a freaking $20 million six man. So that's going to be really interesting to see. I mean, we don't, we still don't even know what's going to happen with John Collins. Like, we talked about this, like, again, on the Friday episode with Jacob. Like, John Collins, may, it, it doesn't seem like he's in their future plans. But if I'm the Hawks, I would want to keep him around. And I think this year is the season where they're gonna, he's going to have to try and prove to them that he is worth keeping around. Because last year, 22-10, and 10, yes, but he had it, the early suspension, and they really haven't gone anywhere with this duo as of yet. And maybe these veterans will kind of change this. But John Collins still needs to stand out and really like try and keep his spot. But yeah, back to Bogdanovich, I, I do believe he's going to be starting, but it's going to be really interesting to see what type of rotation the, um, the Hawks have. Because if these guys um, play to their potential, then I could see them as being one of the deeper teams in the league and I think one of the more surprising teams you're going to see this year in the NBA season. So yeah, those are the free agent moves. Um, um, let me know in the comment section um, what you thought about them and I'll gladly debate them with you. Also, um, DM me, comment on, this, on the post on Instagram and I'll definitely have these conversations about free agency. But let's talk about um, this NBA upcoming season. NBA preseason is starting in 12 days. 12 days. <laughs> I mean, that's crazy to think. Like, I'm honestly just like, how do we get here? How? We definitely, This was the shortest offseason ever. I was expecting the season to go into January. I had all these podcasts planned up. But probably in a week or two, I'm going to be starting preview podcasts, which is absolutely crazy. Um, yeah, they're going to run preseason from December 12th. All the way to um, this to December nineteenth, and we the NBA season is starting. Not only did we have, um, sorry, not December twelfth, December eleventh. Not only did we have um, that date confirmed, we also have other dates confirmed for this um, for this year. So the NBA season is going to be starting on December twenty second, 
and going to um, the, at least the first half, and then it's going to um, have an all-star break at March 5 to 10. After that, they're going to have um, Hall of Fame um, enshrinement in May, May 13th to the 15th, with the second half of the regular season beginning in March 12th all the way to, I believe it's like March May 10th or something. The playing tournament is going to be from May 18th to May 21, and then the playoffs are going to be from May 22 all the way to July 22. I think this is a good thing. I mean, I, I really do feel bad for the teams that were in the bubble. Um, most notably the Lakers and the Heat, who just played, I think, m early to mid-October. And it's basically like just two months removed since then. So highly unfortunate for them. But in order for the NBA to keep making money and to get kind of the most um, out of it to like pay these players, they're gonna have, they need to do this. They absolutely need to do this. This season is going to end in July right before the start of the Olympics. And I think this is just um, a step closer to just normality in the NBA. Um, and hopefully, you know, we can get, maybe not this season, but the season afterwards, hopefully we can get stuff like, you know, fans back in stadiums and just like the whole atmosphere of the NBA back because this season is going to be another weird season. We still don't know the schedule, which is really weird, especially we are kind of less than, um, four weeks away from the start of the regular season. But the NBA is trying to make those steps. Um, we're going to talk about next the COVID protocols that they have. But they really thought this out. And I you have to trust the NBA at this point. Adam Silver has done a lot over these past years to like really gain trust um, from us NBA fans. And we're going to have to trust it. And hopefully it just works out. Speaking of the COVID testing... The NBA has given each team a 164-page manual of for COVID protocol and how this season is going to go. To um, uh, as part of those notes, they're talking about how if a pro a player tests positive for the virus, they're going to be out at least 12 days. The first 10 days, they're going to be quarantined, no questions asked. They have to um, stay away from team activities. They're, then they're going to have a two-day layoff where, um, two days afterwards, where they're going to have to wear masks everywhere they go and just do individual workouts, and then they're going to be cleared to play if they have a, have a negative test. You know, um, they also, and then they also talked about how there are two options. Yes, yeah, so there are two options, like, um, like it's basically two ways for the player to be cleared. One of the ways for them to be cleared is through a time-based method. If the player is infected, um, the player infected has to, um, you know, quarantine for 10 days after a positive test or the start of their system. Basically, they just have to do that um, for them to be clear to play. And they also have to let 24 hours of the fee um, to let the fever pass. And they have to show improved systems for them to be clear to play. But there's another way if they want to um, speed up the process. In order for them to um, really speed up the process and try to get them on the court faster... You're going to have to do testing for three straight days. And two of those days, you have to show negative results on a COVID test. I think that's going to be, like, really interesting to see because, especially for, like, you know, star players in the playoffs, like, um, say, for example, someone does contract a virus. It's going to be really inter interesting to see, like, what type of option they're going to need for them to, like, go back and, like, and participate in team activities because there could be as they seen last year there could be false positives some people um maybe test and say yes you have COVID-19 but they actually they actually don't and if they um come back with two consecutive you know negative tests then they'll be cleared to play which is going to be extremely interesting to see you know probably in the regular season they're going to let them quarantine you know 10 to 12 days as far as the 12 day um minimum um should be I think good enough for that but you know in the playoffs when these when the margins are super thin and you really need to um where every game matters i think a lot of those teams are going to go with this um test-based option you know just hope that like you know their system their symptoms approve saying like you know i'm asymptomatic maybe i don't have the virus and they get to um they do two tests you know on back-to-back -back days and you know they turn out they they have um they're negative and they don't have the COVID-19 so it's going to be really, really interesting to see one how many people do get it and two um, what type of methods these teams are going to use to test them and hopefully get them back on the court. Another thing about the COVID um, 
um, manual is that they said that the NBA hotline is back. Everyone's favorite thing in the world. Um, the snitch line, as people like to call it, it is back. And they have a number where they could just call the um, NBA officer saying um, um, if you're trying to accuse of someone who is not following the COVID guidelines. So, yeah, it's going to be pretty, pretty crazy this season. Like I said, it's it's going to be a lot different from other seasons, even different from the bubble. I mean, there's going to have to be a lot more meticulous, especially because of all the travel and stuff. Once the schedule comes out, we will definitely be discussing um, how kind of the schedule is broken down and such. But as of right now, um, they have this in, um, this in play, the COVID testing. They have the schedule set up, um, at least a general schedule set out. And with the league starting in less than a month, it's going to be really interesting to see how all of this develops. So yeah, those thoughts on the um, NBA upcoming season. Leave your thoughts below on that. And I want to end this podcast on a different note. It's not news or anything, but it's just been a topic that has been going through my head. Last week when we had Jacob, um, of um, aka at Trend Basketball, come on, we were talking about how Derrick Rose could possibly be a Hall of Famer if you give him a championship. I mean, maybe you're going to need a six-man of, uh, of the year award as well to match up with that to um, get him to the Hall of Fame. But it's just something like, you know, NBA championships are so highly revered in the NBA that you're going to need something like that to really take you over the top, whether you want to be in the Hall of Fame or considered as an all-time great. So I thought to myself, who would benefit the most from getting an NBA title? I mean, a title could really change a lot here. And I think there are a couple players in the league who are in desperate need of it for them to either be kind of seen as, you know, one of those players like, um, who is revered in NBA history, or just even to put him into the Hall of Fame? Like you know, a lot like a lot could change for that. Just ask Dirk Nowitzki. I mean, a lot of I mean, he won an MVP before his championship in 2011, but a lot of people just didn't see him as a winner. I mean, he when he won the MVP um, that one season, he he was the first seed, and they got eliminated by the We Believe Warriors in the first round. So, a, like the narrative could switch if you just win the win an NBA championship. And I have two players here um, who I think are desperately needed of one. Um, I'm going to go into my honorable mentions first. Obviously, Derrick Rose. I just think that if he um, got that um, NBA championship and he was actually a big part of that team, um, I just think it just shows that he was able to bounce back from the injury and and kind of like contribute to a championship team in a big way. And I think that just helps his narrative into getting into the Hall of Fame. The other player is KD, and I think just because a lot of people like to discredit his two championships with the Golden State Warriors, and now that he is the undisputed number one guy in Brooklyn, I mean, yes, they have Kyrie, but he is clearly the number two on that team. Um, I just think that if he can like win the title with Brooklyn, I think that a lot of people are going to look at him as, and be like, yep, this guy's probably a top ten player of all time. Doing it in two different teams, doing it in two different conferences, he think I think a lot of people would definitely change their tone on Kevin Durant. But I have two guys I'm going to go kind of more in depth about about the situation, and we're going to be talking about James Harden and Giannis, and they're doing it, and they're and they both need a title for for very similar reasons. Let's start with Harden. He has shown throughout his career that he is one of the most prolific offensive scorers that we have ever seen. I don't care if you don't like his play or not. He has been, he's probably top three, maybe the best um, offensive player of our generation. And he's shown that he could put up the stats. I mean, his last three years, include, um, he has averaged third, over 30 points a game. Um, there has been years where he's almost averaged a triple-double. Like, this guy has... Um, done it all in terms of an individual level. He's got an MVP. He's run it up plenty times. He's a three-time scoring champion, seven-time All-NBA. I can go on and on about how great this guy has been individually. Emphasis on individually. And, you know, over the last few years, I mean, they have he his play has been put into question. Is his play good enough for, t- like, enough to lead a team to a championship? And it hasn't, um, and it hasn't happened. Sadly, the closest they've been was when they had a chance against the Warriors. When they had, when they were, um, when they had him on the ropes, they um, going into Game Six, they thought they were going to win, but the CP3 injury, them missing 27 threes in 
in a row in Game 7 really did crush that opportunity. And Harden needs his title. People know he's a great scorer, but I have a feeling a lot of people like refuse to put him maybe I mean he's borderline top thirty all time, but I think people refuse him to be higher just because he has just disappointed over the past few years in the playoffs. And I think if he wins a championship, I think he just will just shut all those people up. Whether he gets it in Houston, whether he gets it elsewhere. And I think like with the stats already, like if you just look at his stats, he's probably already top thirty all time in the way that he plays. But add a championship to that, and he being the main reason, you know how people he would shut up? And I think a lot of people would, after that, if he did win a title, you know, him being the number one option and stuff, I think they're going to like put him probably top 20 all time, funnily enough. I really think that that could possibly be the case. And, you know, that's still a big if, um, whether he wins a title. Um, I don't think it's going to happen in Houston. He, there, there were rumors very early on in, in the offseason about him being traded. Those rumors have seemed to die down. I don't think I think the Rockets are going to try to make this work this upcoming season. But James Harden is definitely in need of that championship. Same thing with Giannis, man. I mean, he is younger, so he does have a lot more time. But a two-time MVP, back-to-back MVP, this guy has already um, put himself as... Like one of those players, like all time, like um, probably top fifty, to be completely honest. In my opinion, I think he's like a top fifty player all time, just because you know two MVPs, just the dominance he has shown over these last um, four seasons. I just think that he's already like up there. Actually, maybe top fifty is a bit much. Maybe top sixty, but it really depends on what type of list I make. But I think I have the honest there. But he needs that championship. The last few years, he has. Kind of disappointing in the playoffs, let's be completely honest. Um, this past season, especially against the Miami Heat, where they were heavily favorited, and they just went down in five games. Yes, the Heat were in an absolute role, but that's unacceptable coming from a number from the number one seed in the East, where at one point in the season, they people thought they were going to win 70 games. And he's done it all in the regular season. Like I said, two MVPs. Last season's stats were absolutely ridiculous. Basically 30 points, 14 rebounds, and six assists. It's just an absolute ridiculous season from Giannis. But I just think a lot of people are just looking at his play and saying, you know, again, he's one of the most athletic people in the league. He is like one of, probably one of the most dominant people in the paint, if not the most dominant. But he doesn't have a jump shot. At least it's not like really up there yet, but he's still improving. But they're saying like, is this guy like really as good as we think he is? Or is he just like using his... Um, just this frame and stuff, and just like dunking all the time. And mind you, I think that's a skill <laughs> that a lot of people, a lot of people, like, kind of take for granted. But he is just that good. But in order to shut all those people up, getting a title is necessary, and especially him as a number one guy, um, which just possibly be the case this year because you know they've made moves. Yes, the Bogdanovich deal kind of fell through, but bringing in Drew Holiday, kind of um, re, kind of reformatting their bench and stuff like that. They have a better team than they did last year, in my opinion. And I think um, there's no excuses. There's just no excuses. And I think they should they should definitely be in playoff contention. Um, not playoff contention, sorry. And just championship contention. They cannot be disappointing like they had the last two years. I mean, if we just look at two years ago, they had the Raptors on the ropes. 2-1 down in the playoffs. They had to go to, I believe, um, overtime in that game four, which they could have won. But they just let it slip through their fingers. And they let the Raptors, you know, go on and win the championship. Last year was absolutely kind of like a disaster show in the bubble. So you could really, you don't, I don't have to go too much into that. But Giannis just needs that championship like under his belt. And I think that having that this year is probably his best chance at it. And the Miami, the Milwaukee Bucks have done all they could, especially for a small market team. Let's not forget that Milwaukee is a small market team to put the right pieces around him and, like I said, no excuses this year, but I think that this is like that's just something that um, these two players need in James Harden and Giannis because if they have that, trust me when I say this, they're gonna like sky up um, rankings in terms of like all time great players. So these two team, like these two guys, really do need it. Um, Harden probably less likely that he's gonna need to go out of Houston, but right now for Giannis, this is the best chance he's had. Um, he's gonna have this upcoming season. Let's see if he's going to be able 
to pull that off. And I think this is where we're going to end it. Um, thank you guys for watching or listening. Remember to show love on all the podcast channels. Like, share, and subscribe if you're on YouTube. And remember to follow at TV on Basketball on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram for some great content. I'm going to be coming out with another YouTube exclusive video on Wednesday. So remember that you're subscribing and all that so you don't miss out on that. And on Friday, I have another guest coming on. So be on the lookout for that. That's going to be absolutely um, entertaining. Um, we're going to talk more about the upcoming NBA season and stuff like that and probably some other cool topic. So, yeah, remember to show your support and check that out. Thank you guys for all the support you've been showing. Um, we are closing in on 1,900 listens on the podcast, which has been absolutely fantastic. Um, kind of blows my mind. Thank you guys so much. And, yeah, I hope you all have a fantastic day. I'm going to be back um, this um, on your screen on Wednesday on YouTube. And remember, the Friday podcast will be out. So, yeah, that's about it. Uh, thank you guys for watching, and see you guys soon. Take it easy, guys. Peace.